Hello and welcome to the 2018 ABR Non-Interpretive Skills Study Guide Review Series. This is David Larson at Stanford University and thank you for joining me again today. We're continuing where we left off in the study guide. We're in section 5.1 Reimbursement and Regulatory Compliance. First question, to be eligible for reimbursement, all procedures need to be identifiable with what? Each procedure needs to be identifiable with a unique code that acts as a basis for payment. So usually that is the CPT or Current Procedural Terminology Code, which is most commonly used. And the development and maintenance of the code set is controlled by the CPT Editorial Panel, uh, which is appointed by the AMA Board of Trustees. Next question. After a CPT code is approved by the CPT Editorial Panel, what happens to it next? Next, the code is evaluated according to the Resource-Based Relative Value Scale, or RBRBS, methodology by the AMA's RBRBS Update Committee, or the RUC Committee, which is a very powerful committee, as you can imagine. The RUC makes recommendations to CMS, that's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, regarding the Relative Value Unit, or the RBU, assigned for each CPT code. Uh, RBUs are assigned to each code to reflect the encounter time, the intensity, the effort, and the skill. So that's the work RBU. And then also the cost of maintaining a practice, which is incorporated into the RBU as a practice expense RBU. And that includes things like equipment, supplies, and non-physician staff. Um, and also the professional liability expenses are incorporated as the malpractice RBU. CMS can then accept or reject the RBU assignment recommendation, but it tends to accept more than 90% of the recommendations. Minor geographic cost adjustments are applied, and then RBUs are multiplied by the annual conversion factor to determine CMS payments under the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. And you just need to note that uh, many practices use the work RBUs to track physician productivity. Next question. How do CMS and most private insurers decide whether it will pay for an imaging procedure? Well, for a procedure to be reimbursed, it generally must meet criteria to be considered medically necessary, which is defined as healthcare services or supplies needed to prevent, diagnose, or treat an illness, injury, condition, disease, or its symptoms, and that meet accepted standards of medicine. And that determination is generally made when the claim is submitted, and the claim is for an imaging exam is also accompanied by a diagnosis code, or an ICD-10 code, which describes signs, symptoms, or specific diagnosis of a patient that are for the indication for a healthcare service. In other words, it provides the justification why the uh, imaging service is medically necessary. And you should just note that terms such as rule out or consistent with generally can't be coded by ICD-10 and do not by themselves meet medical necessity criteria. Next question. What is reimbursement for radiology services predicated upon? This is a bit of a what am I thinking type of question, but uh, the point here is that if you want to get paid for your services, you've got to have adequate documentation within the radiology report. So uh, we, most practices have professional coders and or software tools that extract information from the report to assign both ICD-10 and CPT codes to the report. Um, and professional coders are certified primarily by the Radiology Coding Certification Board, so it actually is a process to go through to be certified as a professional coder. They extract information from the report using any statement in the report. It may be uh, about the exam indication from the clinical history provided by the provider or the patient. Uh, or it may be from any specific diagnostic information in the findings or the impression section. For radiography, more views generally translates to higher complexity codes, which uh, translates to reimburse, greater reimbursement. For ultrasound, there's uh, generally an or organ inventory checklist that applies, uh, especially for abdomen, pelvis, obstetrical, and extremity ultrasounds. For CT or MR, details of contrast administration also help determine the CPT code level. Um, and as you can imagine, structured reporting templates can help with this to make sure that 
these uh, all the indications are included every time, especially for things like checklists for ultrasound. Next question. What is an RBM and what is preauthorization? An RBM, RBM stands for Radiology Benefit Management. Uh, it's a company that manages payment authorization or preauthorization. So preauthorization means that a radiology facility must get authorization to perform an exam before performing it if they want to get paid. Otherwise, they won't get paid. And uh, if they don't get preauthorization, then the bill is usually sent to the patient if it's not covered by the insurer, which it usually is not if there's no preauthorization when it's required. Preauthorization is necessary for many insurers, but not always a guarantee that the insurer will accept the claim. So just because there's preauthorization doesn't mean that the insurance will actually pay you for the study. In general, preauthorization does not apply to emergency and inpatient services. Next question, what is a false claim and what can happen if a false claim is submitted? Well, the False Claims Act, the FCA, defines a false claim as a request for payment for services that a provider knew or should have known was false or fraudulent. Uh, the U.S. Department of Justice doesn't expect physicians to be experts on all the details, but it has set the expectation that a radiology practices, processes, structures, and cultures be oriented towards optimizing the integrity of revenue cycle operations. And so best practice includes having formal compliance plans with formally designated compliance officer and compliance committee. Basically, they don't necessarily expect every, uh, every claim to be exactly perfect, but if they see a pattern of problems with claims, then that's when they, they uh, aren't too happy with it. Uh, false claim, a false claim ruling can result in fines of up to three times the billed amount plus $11,000 per claim filed. Uh, which includes each single exam. So that can add up very, very quickly. Uh, it often it ends up with a settlement. Uh, the largest government settlement agreement to date for an alleged fraud is $7 million. So in other words, uh, you need to bill for what you actually do. And if you bill for more than what you actually did, um, even if you don't necessarily realize it's happening, if you should have known that it's happening, you don't have good processes in place to make sure that's not getting by, uh, that's fraud, and uh, you can get in big trouble for that. So something to watch out for. Next question, what is HIPAA and what does it govern? HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. A lot of people think that the word privacy is in the title of the act and it's actually not. It's about health insurance portability and accountability. Uh, it provides a national set of privacy standards backed by law and applies to healthcare providers, plans, and clearinghouses, and it governs protected health information, PHI, uh, which is why people assume that HIPAA has, stands for protected health information or privacy. Uh, it concerns both technical and non-technical safeguards that organizations must put in place to secure PHI, including electronic PHI. It's overseen by the Office for Civil Rights, or the OCR, within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS, and it's enforced with civil monetary penalties. And uh, you should just note that most institutions also enforce privacy violations with strict employment disciplinary policies. So this is something to watch out for. This is uh, a HIPAA violation is one good way to get yourself fired. Next question, what counts as PHI? PHI, or Protected Health Information, is essentially any information that can be used to identify an individual, uh, and that information is collected in the course of uh, providing health care. Uh, some examples include uh, name, geographic, subdivision, smaller than a state, except you can use the first three digits of zip code representing a population of greater than 20,000, but even a zip code can be considered as PHI. All elements of dates, except the year, are related to an individual such as a birth date, admission date, discharge date, and date of death, phone number, fax number, email address, social security number, medical record number, health plan beneficiary number, an account number, or certificate or license number, vehicle identification and license plate numbers, device identification and serial numbers, a web page URL, an IP address, a biometric identifier such as a finger or voice print, 
full face or similar photograph, and any other unique identifier, characteristic, or code. So basically, if you can use the information to identify the individual, then that counts as PHI. Next question. PHI disclosure or transmission must be specifically authorized by the individual except when? So the three main times when a PHI can be exchanged when it doesn't specifically have to be authorized by the individual about whom the PHI is con uh, concerning is number one, in the course of delivering care or treatment, of course. Number two, associated with payment activities. And number three, as part of healthcare operations involving quality assurance or compliance. Um, also, when it's required by law, information can be released to public health authorities during the investigations of abuse, neglect, or domestic violence, uh, to oversight agencies, for judicial and administrative proceedings, for law enforcement purposes, and for workers' compensation. Next question, what are the origins of modern human subjects research protection and what are its major principles? Human subjects research protection really came out of the Nuremberg Code out of post-war uh, World War II Germany. This was in response to abuses perpetrated during Nazi Germany and it maintains that experiments on human subjects should occur only with subjects who have freely chosen to participate and in the context of clear scientific rationale. Uh, this was then further refined in the Declaration of Helsinki in 1964 which recommended that all research protocols be reviewed by an independent committee prior to initiation and that led to the development of the Institutional Review Board, or the IRB system. Next question, what is an IRB and what are its rights and responsibilities? Well, an IRB, as we just mentioned, is the Institutional Review Board, and that is an appropriately constituted group in the university or health system which is formally designated to review and monitor biomedical research involving human subjects. So according to the FDA, the IRB has the authority to approve, require modifications, or deny approval to research protocols, and it's required to ensure diversity of its members on the board, including diversity in race, gender, cultural backgrounds, and sensitivity to such issues such as community attitudes. It's required to register with the Department of Health and Human Services, and institutions may have their own IRB, or they may contract with an outside IRB to assume oversight responsibilities. Next question, what are general expectations for research protocols regarding human subjects participation? Well, researchers should first provide adequate information about the study to potential subjects. They should provide adequate opportunity for subjects to consider all options. They should respond adequately to all subjects' questions. They should ensure that subjects comprehend all necessary questions. They should obtain subjects' voluntary agreement to participate and provide ongoing information as a subject or a situation requires. So it's essentially informed consent uh, to the subject. The IRB may waive the requirement for informed consent when the research involves no more than minimal risks to participants or when it cannot, and when it cannot uh, practically be carried out without such a waiver. The IRB typically exempts review for re uh, the review requirement for quality improvement projects as long as, and this is the, the key, as long as the primary objective of the project is to improve local practice rather than to create generalizable knowledge. If the objective of your project is to make things better at your institution, then often the requirement for review is waived, and that's even if you end up publishing it. The publication is a separate issue. Um, it's about what your primary intent was, whether it was to improve local practice or to uh, create generalizable knowledge. Uh, and you should also know that IRB approval is not required for non-human subjects research such as public data sets because that's not considered, uh, uh, there's no identifiable information in there, so there's no human subjects to research in that situation. All right, let's move on to our next section, that's section 5.2, malpractice and risk management. First question in this section, how prevalent are medical malpractice lawsuits? Well, approximately 7% of radiologists are named in a malpractice suit each year. Radiology payments in malpractice cases average about $480,000. The average radiologist spends about 19 months of their career with an open malpractice claim. 
and uh, just on a related note, uh, greater than 90% of physicians report engaging in defensive medicine. So uh, medical malpractice is, uh, does have an influence on the practice of medicine. Next question, what is the difference between claims made and occurrence malpractice insurance policies? Well, claims made policies only cover claims while the policy is in effect. Uh, so it's only while the claim is being made that your policy uh, covers it. And that's the most common type of medical malpractice insurance. On the other hand, occurrence policies cover any claim that occurred during the period of coverage, even if the claim is made after the policy lapses. So it's about whether you had in, uh, insurance when it occurred. Um, for those with claims made insurance, they may need to purchase so-called tail insurance when retiring or changing uh, jobs to basically turn it into occurrence uh, insurance rather than claims made insurance so that you're, you're covered after you leave uh, a job. Next question, what four elements must be established for a medical malpractice lawsuit to be successful? For a medical malpractice lawsuit to be successful, the plaintiff must establish four elements. First, the physician must have an established duty to care for a patient. Second, there must have been a breach of duty, meaning a failure to meet the standard of care. Third, causation must exist, meaning that the breach must have been the proximate cause of injuries. And fourth, negligence must result in damages. So some examples uh, regarding the established duty, for example, a, a physician or a radiologist would be expected to treat a contrast reaction occurring in the radiology department in which they're working, or a radiologist would be expected to interpret a study submitted through the regular policy uh, through their system. Uh, they would not be expected to interpret the contents of a scan on a CD in a patient's purse, for example. In terms of breach of duty, uh, what the standard of care it really refers to is how a reasonable, prudent, or ordinary physician of similar specialty would have acted in similar circumstances. So it doesn't expect exemplary or extraordinary care. It just is uh, how a reasonable, or reasonable, prudent, or ordinary physician would have acted. Uh, third, causation. Uh, some examples, uh, for example, a radiologist who misses a lung mass on a chest radiograph that leads to lung cancer that's no longer resectable, uh, that would count for causation, but not for a radiologist who misses a lung mass on a chest radiograph and then the patient dies of a stroke for the next day. So it's got to be the cause of the injuries. And then finally, damages can include things like emotional distress, pain, and suffering when considering uh, any uh, rem remunerative uh, damages. Next question, what are the three general categories of claims of negligence against radiologists? The most common claims against radiologists generally fall into one of three categories, those being diagnostic error, which is the most common, procedural complications, and communication deficiencies. Next question, how are negligent diagnosis claims generally categorized? So negligent diagnosis claims are usually fall into one of three categories. Failure of perception, so not identifying a finding. Failure of interpretation, meaning you identify a finding but not appropriately appreciating or adequately communicating its significance. Or, I guess you could call a third category a combination of the two. Um, you could also uh, consider diagnostic error as a cognitive error or a system error. Next question. What factors increase the likelihood of success of a lawsuit based on procedural complications? Well, a lawsuit is more likely to be successful when the radiologist did not exercise appropriate care in, number one, minimizing the risk of the complication, number two, identifying the complication once it occurred, and then number three, treating the complication. So for example, uh, in the case of a pneumothorax after a lung biopsy, uh, where if a radiologist used an overly large needle for a procedure or chose a trajectory that was unnecessarily crossing aerated lung would be at high risk for that uh, lawsuit to be successful. If they did not obtain a post-procedural chest radiograph or if they discharged the patient to home with an enlarging pneumothorax, all of those would be more likely to result in a successful lawsuit. Next question, what do most risk managers advocate regarding disclosure of errors and complications? 
Most risk managers advocate appropriate and thorough informed consent prior to the procedures, of course, uh, and then full and prompt disclosure of untoward events once they occur. And, and we should also recognize that this is an ethical imperative as well. We're ethically obligated in addition to the fact that it decreases our risk for a lawsuit. Uh, we should maintain ongoing communication about decision making and treatment after we have disclosed that error uh, and detailed and contemporaneous documentation of events, discussions and rationale for decisions are important. Uh, we should note that patients and families are more likely to sue if they believe details of their care were withheld. So generally, the uh, both the ethical and the legal imperative is to be open and inclusive when errors occur. Next question, what is meant by routine communication in radiology, and what report elements are recommended in routine communication? Routine communication refers to the creation and delivery of written interpretive reports of imaging, and the recommended elements include relevant demographic and identifying information, such as the patient name or ID, referring physician facility information, examination details, such as the type and time of examination, including contrast administration and the time of dictation, report content recommendations, uh, such as findings, impressions, limitations, and complications. So those are the major elements, and uh, it's important to recognize that it's acceptable for information to be contained in the metadata rather than in the report itself. So, for example, the time when the uh, report was issued can be a timestamp in the metadata. Next question, what standards should the final radiology report meet? Well, this is a bit of a what am I thinking type of question, but in general, uh, radiology reports should be free of typographical errors and confusing or conflicting statements. There should be limited use of abbreviations or acronym. They should be in accordance with relevant state and federal requirements, such as the Mammography Quality Standards Act, or MQSA. And a copy of the final report should be archived by the imaging facility as part of the medical record and be retrievable for future reference and be retained and distributed in accordance with all state and federal regulations and facility policies. Next question, what is meant by non-routine communication in radiology and what are examples? Non-routine communication refers to communication other than the official radiology report. And that includes situations warranting preliminary reports and results of urgent or other significantly important uh, nature. Uh, preliminary reports may be uh, needed when immediate patient management is required. Uh, for example, action may be needed before comparison exams are available. Um, it may be needed to meet the needs of local, the local practice environment. So, for example, a training in a teaching institution or a general radiologist in a general uh, a general practice radiologist in a subspecialty practice uh, may provide a preliminary report on a routine basis. But preliminary communications should always be documented and archived. Institutions are expected to maintain policies for reconciling discrepancies between preliminary and final reports, and also a final report and then a subsequent review of that final report if there's ever a discrepancy. Any clinically significant difference between the preliminary and final interpretation should be clearly documented and reported as soon as, pass as soon as possible in a manner that ensures the receipt by the ordering or treating physician. In other words, you need to let people know and you need to document that you have spoken to someone or that it's been communicated and you know that they have received it. Next question. What situations warrant non-routine communication to supplement routine communication? So in other words, when should you get on the phone and call a uh, uh, ordering physician or make sure that they understand what's going on in addition to the routine radiology report? So first, findings that warrant immediate or urgent intervention. And second, findings that may not require immediate attention but nonetheless may seriously impact a patient's health, worsen over time, or result in adverse outcome if it's not recognized. Uh, in other words, if, if uh, it can be missed, it may not... Be, need to be taken care of immediately, but if it can be missed, uh, and if it, missing it would cause uh, significant patient harm, then you need to, to make sure that that communication happens. So rule of thumb is, when in doubt, get on the phone and talk to someone. Uh, there should 
be documentation of all non-routine communication, which should include the date and time of the communication, the person reporting the information, the person receiving the information, and a summary or a reference to the information that was conveyed. Next question. Discuss important elements of communication of findings that warrant immediate or urgent intervention. So these are new or unexpected findings that suggest life-threatening conditions or require immediate change in patient management. And institutions are required by the Joint Commission to define critical results and how they'll be handled. And a critical result is defined as any result or finding that may be considered life-threatening or result in severe morbidity and require urgent or emergent clinical attention. Examples include tensile pneumothorax, ruptured aortic aneurysm, acute intracerebral hemorrhage, pneumoperitoneum, basically big things that you just have to let people know immediately as soon as you find them. Uh, facilities often will define a uh, critical results list and uh, maintain and monitor those the communication of those results. And this requires direct contact between radiologists and the requesting or responding clinician or another licensed healthcare provider responsible for that patient. These are generally expected to occur within 60 minutes of the time the observation is made. Uh, they must be documented. And when the referring provider cannot be contacted, it may be appropriate to convey the results directly to the patient if necessary. Next question, what does the ACR recommend regarding informal communications or so-called curbside consults? Well, informal communication is when a radiologist provides an interpretation that does not result in a formal report but is nonetheless used to make treatment decisions. And this may occur informally in the reading room or at a clinical conference, and circumstances often preclude immediate documentation and may occur in suboptimal viewing conditions and carry inherent risk since the clinician's documentation may be the only written record of the communications. So informal communications are largely discouraged by the ACR and other entities, and when they do occur, radiologists should document them independently. But for the most part, we should try to avoid those situations. Next question, what does the ACR recommend regarding reporting studies performed at outside institutions? Often it may be appropriate to report on studies that were performed elsewhere, but the radiology department should establish relevant processes and policies concerning reporting those types of studies. Uh, they should be encouraged to document any information conveyed, including uh, formal interpretations. And historically, often they've not been payable, but increasingly these uh, interpretations are being reimbursed. Next question, what information is and is not discoverable in court? Granted, this is a bit of a what am I thinking type of question, but discoverable means admissible in court, including in malpractice lawsuits. And most communication related to a clinical case, written or oral, is discoverable. Information that is shared with attorneys and marked as such is generally protected from legal discovery. And most jurisdictions also protect peer review activities as long as they're related to ongoing quality assurance or improvement including peer review. However, and this is very important to note, communications must take place within the established peer review and QA, QI processes. So for example, informal conversation that take place outside the peer review processes are generally not protected. And that concludes our review. I hope this has been helpful. If so, please let your classmates and colleagues know and feel free to provide me with your feedback. Thank you again for watching. This is David Larson wishing you the best of luck on the exam and throughout your career.